Today we are looking at a case from the mid 18th century. So sit back as we go to England. Elizabeth Canning was born in London on the 17th of September, 1734. She was the eldest of five children and lived with her father named William who worked as a carpenter and her mother also named Elizabeth. At the time, London was a rapidly growing city. Large houses for the wealthy were built around great squares and as the city expanded to the south and the east, trade increased. For the poor, however, it was an overcrowded and polluted place. Open sewers ran through the centre of many streets and living conditions were harsh. Elizabeth lived with her family, occupying just two rooms in a house in a part of London known as Alder Manbury Poston. It was considered a respectable area, although most of the residents were not very wealthy. She'd only received a basic education, as attending school was not compulsory, although many children did attend charity or religious institutions. She learned to read and write, and when she finished, she obtained work as a maidservant to a publican named John Whittlebury. In 1751, tragedy struck the family when Elizabeth's father died, leaving her mother a widow. Elizabeth was now 17 years old. In order to obtain more income, Elizabeth's mother, Mrs. Canning, sublet one of the two rooms they occupied to a young apprentice named James Lord. Elizabeth was a very hard-working and honest young lady, and her employer, Mr. Whittlebury, considered her to be a very good character, but she was shy and reserved. She contracted smallpox as a child, and her face had been left scarred. In October 1752, she moved from her mother's small rented room and took a room in the house of a carpenter named Edward Lyon. He was a neighbour in Alder Manbury Poston, and it meant that she could see her mother every day. She continued to work for the publican, Mr John Whittlebury. She celebrated New Year's Eve in 1752, and on the 1st of January 1753, went to visit her uncle and aunt, named Mr Thomas and Mrs Alice Colley. It was a cold day, and although Elizabeth had agreed to accompany her mother to the market in the afternoon, she decided to instead stay with her uncle and aunt. At about 9pm, she left their house, and they walked with Elizabeth some of the way home, before leaving her to complete the last part of her journey alone. But Elizabeth Canning did not return. When she failed to return to her lodgings at the house of Mr Edward Lyon, he went to see if she was with her mother. Mrs Canning sent her older children into the street to see if they could find her, while James Lord, the young man who rented one of Mrs Canning's rooms, made his way to Mr and Mrs Coley's house to see if Elizabeth was still there. When he arrived, they told him that they had accompanied her to Allgate Church in Houndsditch, where Elizabeth said that she would be fine to walk the rest of her way home alone. News soon spread about the missing young lady, and over the next few days, Mrs Canning and her neighbours searched the area. It seemed that everyone knew that Elizabeth had not made her way home, and were aware of her appearance and the route that she would have taken. But there was no trace of Elizabeth. It was as if she had just vanished. Her mother continued to look for her. She would go out into the crowds of people and see if her daughter was amongst them. James Lord would also search after his working day had finished. Elizabeth was a respectable young lady and this was very much out of character for her. As weeks passed, Mrs Canning started to fear that something untoward may have happened to her daughter. Four weeks later, on the 29th of January 1753, Mrs Canning was preparing to go to bed when she looked up, and there in front of her was a young lady, who was in a deplorable condition. Her face and hands were black with dirt. She was wearing a petticoat and a bedgown. A dirty rag was tied around her head, which was soaked with blood from a wound to her ear. But despite the terrible state of the young lady, Mrs Canning instantly realised that the person in front of her was her daughter Elizabeth. Mrs Canning was so overwhelmed that she fainted. Once recovered, she sent her children to fetch James Lord, and soon other neighbours gathered in the small room. Most had given up hope of seeing her again. Elizabeth then started to tell a strange and frightening tale. She said that she was walking home on the 1st of January, when she was attacked by two men, close to the Bedlam Hospital. They robbed her, and hit her in the temple, 
after which she became unconscious. She eventually awoke by a large road near some water. The two men who robbed her then made her walk to a house where an old lady asked her if she would go their way, which in 1753 meant workers are prostitutes. Elizabeth refused, so the old lady slapped her face and made her go to the loft. She also took her corsets. She added that she was held there and just given bread and water. She found some old clothes in the loft and was eventually able to get out by pulling some boards away from a window and escaping. She then walked for five hours to get home. She said that she heard the name Wills or Wells and that looking out of the window, she had seen a coachman who she recognised and thus believed that she may have been somewhere on the Hartford Road. People were very intrigued by her story and two gentlemen named John Wintleberry and Robert Scarrett, both very familiar with much of London, believed that the house where Elizabeth had been held belonged to a lady named Mrs Susanna Wells and it was in Enfield Wash, nearly 10 miles from Elizabeth's home in Aldermanbury Poston. The next day, the newspaper, the London Daily Advertiser, printed her story. This included that she had been held in the house of Mrs Susanna Wells. After being seen by a doctor, Elizabeth was taken to the Guild Hall to see the alderman. The alderman questioned her and issued a warrant for Mrs Wells' arrest. A warrant officer and peace officers were sent to the home where it was believed that Elizabeth had been held. The house itself was used as a carpenter's shop, a butcher's, and an alehouse. Mrs Wells had twice been widowed. Her first husband, who worked as a carpenter, died, and her second husband had been hanged for theft. In 1736, she herself had served time in prison for perjury. Although Elizabeth was weak after her ordeal, she was taken to the house to see if she could identify the lady who had locked her in the loft. Everyone in the house was arrested, and Elizabeth identified Susanna Wells and another lady named Mary Squires as a woman who had cut off her corsets. She also identified a lady named Virtue Halls as being present, along with someone who she presumed to be Mrs Wells's daughter. It was suspected that Mrs Wells' son John was one of the men who had abducted Elizabeth on New Year's Day. The warrant officer searched for loft, but discovered that it did not resemble the room described by Elizabeth. He could not find evidence that she had escaped through a window, although when Elizabeth was taken upstairs, she confirmed that it was a loft where she had been held. The appearance of Mrs Squires was also not as Elizabeth had described. Nevertheless, Mrs Wells and Mrs Squires were arrested. The warrant officer also charged Mrs Wells for keeping a disorderly house. The issue for Elizabeth, however, was that in 1753, assault was not considered a criminal issue, but a civil action between two parties in dispute. This meant that Elizabeth would have to take legal action against those she claimed had imprisoned her and stolen her clothes. Of course, this was an expensive proposition, especially for someone who worked as a maidservant. While she recovered, her friends and supporters prepared the case against Mrs Squires and Mrs Wells. They were advised by a solicitor named Mr Salt to speak with a magistrate, a gentleman named Henry Fielding. He was quite intrigued by the case and issued a warrant against everyone who resided in Mrs Wells's house. Newspapers continued to report the alleged crime. A poor servant girl held capture, threatened with prostitution, but had managed to escape and eventually returned to her widowed mother. They wrote about Mrs Squires in a very unpleasant manner. They did this in the knowledge that in 1753, many people would consider her guilty and be even more enthralled with the story. A pamphlet was printed named the case of Elizabeth Canning, which asked for donations so a prosecution could be launched. Mrs Squires and Mrs Wells were described as terrible women. It was a story that seemed to have fascinated the whole country and Elizabeth received support from many wealthy residents. Two sides had emerged, the Canningites who supported Elizabeth and those who believed Mrs Squires and Mrs Wells to be innocent. Henry Fielding, interviewed everyone who had stayed at the house during January. He had found some discrepancies of Elizabeth's story, especially the room where she had supposedly been held. Mary Squires was adamant that she had been away from London in January, and there were witnesses who confirmed this. However, one of the witnesses, named Virtue Halls, told him that Mary Squires' son John, along with another gentleman, 
had brought Elizabeth Canning to the house on the 2nd of January. Mrs Squires had removed her corsets and then forced her into the loft where she remained until she escaped. She added that following the escape, a gentleman named Fortune Natus and his wife Judith, who had been staying in the house, were moved to the loft and it was made to appear as though they had been there for some time. When Henry Fielding spoke to Judith Natus, she told him that she had stayed in the loft with her husband throughout January. Mrs Squires and Mrs Wells were then charged with assault and theft. The trial began on the 21st of February 1753. The Lord Mayor of London, Sir Crisp Gascoigne, presided over a panel of judges. The serious charges was the theft of Elizabeth Canning's corset, which was valued at 10 shillings. This was a crime that carried the death penalty. When Elizabeth arrived at court, she was cheered by the large crowd that had gathered outside. She repeated her story to the judges, telling them that she had been attacked on her way home and taken prisoner in the Wells house. Then, as she refused to work as a prostitute, Mrs Squires cut off her corset, slapped her face and pushed her up the stairs into the loft. She went on to describe the room, how she was fed only bread and water and how she eventually escaped. Elizabeth was cross-examined by William Davy, who questioned her recollection of the events. Asked why she had not attempted to escape earlier, she replied, because I thought they might let me out. Other witnesses, including Virtue Hall, were called, who all repeated the statements they had previously made to Henry Fielding. There were three witnesses from the county of Dorset, who testified that Mrs Squires had been in the county selling handkerchiefs in the first part of January. However, this was contradicted by a fishmonger named John Inneser, who told the court that he knew Mrs Squires and that he had seen her in early January, telling fortunes in the area near the Wells house. When the trial ended, Mrs Squires and Mrs Wells were both found guilty. Mrs Wells' punishment was to be publicly branded with the letter T on her thumb, which stood for thief, and spend six months in prison, while Mrs Squires was sentenced to be hanged. Soon after, pamphlets about the case were printed and were read in coffee houses all over London. Not everyone believed that the verdict was just. The trial judge, Sir Chris Gascoigne, wondered if Elizabeth's story was true, especially as it had a number of discrepancies. The people who had gathered outside the court and had jeered and shouted at witnesses for the defence, preventing some of them from entering the courts. He began a private inquiry and enlisted the help of the Anglican minister at Abbotsbury, named James Harris. He confirmed that Mrs Squires had been in Dorset in January. He even found new witnesses who said that they would testify that they had seen her. Eventually, 15 prominent residents of the small Dorset village of Abbotsbury, including church wardens, overseers of the poor and a schoolmaster, came forward to confirm that they had seen Mrs Squires in early January. It was the testimony of Mrs Virtue Hall that had been so compelling in court, as she had said that Mrs Squires had taken Elizabeth Canning's corsets and placed her in the loft. But Sir Crisp Gascoigne learnt that she had only said this after Henry Fielding had threatened her with imprisonment. Based on the investigation and his concerns that Miss Elizabeth Canning had not been telling the truth, he ordered that she be arrested for perjury and that Mrs Squires be released. King George II then granted a stay of execution of six weeks for Mrs Squires, while further investigations continued. The supporters of Elizabeth Canning were outraged. They took to the streets, and when the King's coach passed, they shouted abuse at him. A gentleman named Mr John Miles, who was a great supporter of Elizabeth Canning, tried to have the people who had provided Mary Squires with an alibi charged with perjury. They were all arrested and the trial started on the 6th of September 1753 at the Old Bailey. All were found to be not guilty. Elizabeth Canning was not seen for a while, but the press continued to report news of the story, and the case still fascinated the public. Eventually, she presented herself to the authorities. She was then charged with perjury. Her trial began on the 29th of April 1754. Her claim that she had been attacked and taken to the house of Mrs Wells where Mrs Squires had removed her corsets and placed her in a loft, was questioned by the prosecution. Witnesses gave evidence 
but the defence seized upon the prosecution's unwillingness to call virtual hall to the stand. Crowds gathered outside the Old Bailey on each day of the trial, and as the prosecution lawyers left court, they would be heckled by the many supporters of Elizabeth Canning. Many witnesses gave evidence, and the trial did not end until the 8th of May. The jury took almost two hours to return a verdict of guilty of perjury, but not willful and corrupt. The recorder, however, refused to accept the verdict as it was partial, and the jury then took another 20 minutes to find Elizabeth Canning guilty of willful and corrupt perjury. When the large crowd outside the courtroom were informed of the verdict, they were most dissatisfied, and loud jeers of disapproval could be heard all around the Old Bailey. Elizabeth was sentenced to one month in prison, to be followed by transportation to America for seven years. She served her prison sentence in Newgate, where she was visited by Mr Justice Ledinard. He asked her to confess. She, however, replied, I have said the whole truth in court, and nothing but the truth, and I don't choose to answer any questions, unless it be in court again. Before she left for America, her supporters raised money to make her voyage comfortable. They also supplied her with money for a new start. She arrived in Wethersfield, Connecticut, and became part of the household of Reverend Elisha Williams. After he died in 1755, she married a gentleman named Mr. John Treat, a grandson of a former governor of Connecticut. On the 24th of November, 1756, she gave birth to a son, who the couple named Joseph Canning Treat. This was followed in June 1758 by a daughter named Elizabeth. She later gave birth to two more sons. Elizabeth Canning died suddenly in June 1773, aged 38. To this day, people still speak about the case of Elizabeth Canning and speculate as to what actually happened on New Year's Day 1753. The case was remarkable, not only for what happened to Elizabeth, but it divided public opinion and was reported and read about daily in the media. Hello everyone, and thanks for listening. This is a case that has fascinated me for a long time, and I'd be really interested to read any opinions you may have on what you think happened to Elizabeth. I personally have heard many different theories. Thank you again for listening, and I hope to see you all in the next brief case. <laughs>